Hi, this is Glenn Lowry, host of The Glenn Show. The Glenn Show is sponsored by the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research in New York, New York City, where I am the John Paulson Senior Fellow. You're hearing this announcement from me because we've had a slight change of schedule. Unfortunately, for circumstances beyond our control, John McWhorter and I have been unable to record our conversation this week, the one which was uh, announced to be posted this week. Uh, we are putting off by one week uh, the posting of a new conversation from Glenn and John, the black guys. Um, and instead, uh, I am going to share with you my exchange with Steve McIntosh, who's president of the Institute for Cultural Evolution. Uh, we talk about the Institute's work. So with apologies for this disruption in schedule, know that John and I will be back for our bi-weekly conversation next week. And uh, I invite you to enjoy my exchange with Steve McIntosh, which follows immediately. Thanks. Hello there, Steve. How are you? Hi, Glenn. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you. I am Glenn Lowry. This is The Glenn Show, sponsored by the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research, where I am John Paulson, Senior Fellow, and I'm with Steve McIntosh, who's president of the uh, Institute for Cultural Evolution in Boulder, Colorado, uh, and uh, is a friend of a friend of mine, Stephanie Lepp, whom uh, you've seen here at the Glenn Show uh, talking with me in the past, uh, and uh, author of books. What, what, what's your book, Steve? Well, my latest book's called The Developmental Politics, How America Can Grow Into a Better Version of Itself. Okay. And we're talking about how America can overcome the political polarization that seems to be stymieing everything we're trying to do here cooperatively as a nation and uh, get to a better place. So welcome, Steve. Thank you, Glenn. Um, I can say that the focus of the book Developmental Politics and our larger think tank, the Institute for Cultural Revolution, is on the cultural dimensions of America's maladies, right? Not only is there a significant cultural dimension to hyperpolarization, there's also a cultural dimension to wokeism or, you know, the, the, move, the ideological movement, uh, sometimes called anti-racism. And so recognizing the deeper cultural dimensions is, is part of the value we're trying to bring. What do you mean cultural dimensions of America's conflict? Sure. Well, culture can be understood in a variety of ways. There's a whole bunch of competing academic definitions. But we basically understand culture as our, our, the shared agreements, the shared meanings, the shared values that, that comprise our, our connection, our we space, as it's sometimes called. And as we look at culture, the best way to understand the, 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 the bedrock values level of its development is to see how these values that constitute culture cohere into kind of sets of values, or systems of values. And, and the most concrete example of this is during the Enlightenment, 300 years ago, we see the emergence of a new kind of culture, right, which sort of is best known as modernity, right, the, the classical liberal values that, that liberate the, the cultures that adopt this modernist frame from the, the restraints of the religious civilizations that dominated human history for thousands of years before the emergence of modernity. So, so when we think about what is modernity, right? I mean, it's, it's lots of things. It's, it's science, it's classical liberal values, it's uh, uh, economic development, it's all these things. But what makes it cohere as, as a, a culture that can deliver you know, prosperity and, and liberty is that it is, it's best understood as a worldview, as, as a system of values. And it contrasts with the previous religious worldview. There's a, there's a kind of a, a dialectical separation pushing off, where, wherein, you know, sometimes modernity is able to break with religious tradition in a way that, that creates a truce where they can work together, like as you see to a degree in the American Revolution. 
And then sometimes there's a, a, a violent break and, and a kind of a complete suppression, or at least an attempted suppression of the previous traditional religious worldview, as you see in the, the French Revolution. But anyway, th this idea that we have modernity and, and the, the pre-modern traditional forms of, of culture, this is a well-accepted two-stage model, if you will, that you see uh, repeated in many different academic disciplines. They don't always frame it as worldviews, and it's not always focused on values. But the idea of, of the traditional religious civilizations that dominated humanity for thousands of years and that still constitute the kind of cultural center of gravity for the majority of humanity, and the emergence of modernity, where in parts of the developed world where it's taken hold, has created, uh, I think, it's an improvement of the human condition in multiple dimensions, uh, it needs to be honored. Um, and so we sort of start there, right, with these two major stages of culture. And then we begin to recognize that, at least for the past 50 years, um, a third major worldview has emerged. Now, perhaps not as historically significant as modernity and, and traditionalism, but this third major worldview, which we term the progressive postmodern worldview, the, the reason that we can compare and contrast it to traditionalism and modernity is that it's in a kind of a dialectical separation. It, it, it rejects modernity. It kind of gains traction in history by pushing off against what we might call the negative externalities of modernity, right? Uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, destruction, or like the war in Vietnam, or gross inequality, or, you know, de jure segrega segregation like existed in the United States uh, in the 60s. These were all significant problems that the, the sort of the American establishment, the truce of traditionalism and modernity in America hadn't solved. So this progressive postmodern worldview emerges in the 60s. I mean, we can see traces of it for decades before, but it really emerges, it becomes democratized as a, a sort of a youth movement in the 60s. And it's now matured over the decades so that even though there's many ideologies within it, we can't reduce it to a single ideology. It does shed a lot of light on where progressivism, progressive postmodernism is going, why it has become in some ways a threat to the best of what's come before, why it's given rise to um, particularly militant ideologies like, I guess we could call it the Black Lives Matter movement, and, and how we can take these developments in our stride by recognizing that while there's some forces of decay, there are also forces of growth, and, and harnessing those forces of growth to, to move beyond progressivism, to transcend it and include it in a new cultural structure that represents a kind of a synthesis of these three major worlds. So that's a mouthful, but that gives you sort of the outline. Yeah, that, that is quite a bit. I mean, can we just take it one step at a time? Sure. Okay, so we have the enlightenment. We, we have the triumph of scientific rationality over religious superstition. We have this idea of representative government, that what is it that makes legitimate the power of the state, uh, con social contract, or ideas of this kind. Uh, we, we have this prizing of individual rights, of, of, of liberties, of the dignity of the human person. That, that uh, change in sensibility is an illustration of cultural evolution in, in your uh, view of things? Definitely. The emergence of that package of values and, and perspectives and approaches and methods that you just described we frame that as the worldview of modernity. And you know, we're so, certainly not the only ones to do that. I mean, look at what that does. That makes Galileo not an, uh, a criminal, a thought criminal. Th that makes uh, uh, the uh, emancipation of slaves a moral imperative. Uh, that makes uh, the equality of uh, status of women before the law uh, a moral imperative. Uh, that makes the... the commerce on freedom of uh, exchange and property rights and rule of law uh, and, and institutional achievement. You're comparing that profound transformation in human culture to what's going on right now with uh, postmodern, anti-racist, Black Lives Matter agitation. I mean, that seems like apples and oranges to me. Sure. Well, let me just explain that, that modernity is, as many commentators have called it, as the great fact, 
right? It's, it's like the Cambrian explosion in cultural evolution. In the same way that in biological evolution, the Cambrian explosion brought about the backbone, right? The vertebrate, which is sort of formed the foundation for all future, you know, complex organisms. Modernity gives us backbone as citizens. It makes us sovereign political actors. And it's, it's going to be necessary to preserve that key innovation for all further cultural evolution. Now, I'm not saying that, that progressive postmodern culture is anywhere as significant or as morally profound as modernity, yeah. right? I'm not trying right. to reduce it to that or reduce modernity to that. But it is a predictable kind of reaction, a, an antithesis, right? That the giant thesis of modernity, where do you go from there, right? The, 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 the striving for cultural evolution, that, that sort of need for a sense of transcendence, uh, the evolutionary rest, restlessness uh, that, that is a part of the human condition leads to people to try to go beyond it. Whether they go beyond it successfully or not is certainly something we can you know, talk about. But if we it can at least view progressive postmodernism, despite its pathologies and its threats, part of the way of going beyond it is to understand it as sympathetically as we can so that we can we can effectively transcend it. You know, instead of being in a boxing match with it, we can kind of do a judo move on it and and get beyond it by carrying forward the best and pruning away the worst of this cultural attempt to transcend modernity. Okay. Uh, can we talk in more concrete terms? What would be an example within the current political culture of the United States? whether it's, I don't know, affirmative action or diversity, equity, and inclusion stuff, whether it's about transgender and gender identity stuff, uh, whether it's about Donald Trump and, and the politics of uh, anti-elite, uh, you, know, uh, you know, coastal versus uh, the middle of the country, red state, blue state stuff. But what or climate change, you mentioned that in our introductory discussion. I'm, I'm trying to get my hands around these ideas and I need some help in, in terms of, of uh, sure. you know, so, illustration. Yeah. So, so the, the as it's, you know, first sort of emerges as a discrete kind of culture in the 60s, the opportunity to, to make the world a better place, at least as is perceived by the, you know, progenitors of postmodernity is defined by what's wrong with modernity, right? So the, the, the concern about uh, um, civil rights not being fully developed, the concern about the degradation of the environment, the concern about um, the women's liberation movement not have, having um, uh, achieved full success. Um, there, there's a whole variety at the beginning, like in the 60s, of sort of propositions of, of cultural transcendence, if you will, that help form that culture, right? And even though those are discrete things, you can see in the culture itself how they're, they're, um, they, they form a, a, a loose hole, right? That the people who are uh, for, for civil rights are generally people who are uh, concerned about the environment. The, the worldview helps create identity and give meaning to what's important. So the, the, it begins in the 60s with the sort of 60s culture, which has a variety of causes that are in alliance with, with each other. And then as it matures, those, those um, values or those concerns, the, the, the chief goals of this emerging worldview, um, we, can be, we can see them uh, in uh, you know, the environmental movement. We can see it in the transgender movement. You know, we can see it in the variety of forms of, of uh, wokeism, if you'll allow me to use that term. Um, one, of the, one of the things that binds all these different cultural threads together is an agreement regarding the abundant pathologies of modernity, a sort of anti-modernism, and what's now uh, emerging is what we might call reverse patriotism. So, you know, that is the, the, the things that were held dear by these previous worldviews are in some ways that which this new antithetical worldview attacks. So there's an attack on patriotism, there's an attack on liberal values, right? The, 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 the pathologies of progressivism after its you know 50 year run as a kind of a counterculture in america it be, because it's sort of attracted a significant portion of the educated elite it's captured many institutions this signals the, the point at which the, the, the this 
this cultural thrust is beginning to become exhausted, that its pathologies are beginning to overtake the good that it may have done and is trying to do. I mean, we can. I'm sorry, to, are those the pathologies of modernity or of postmodernity? No, the pathologies of this progressive postmodern worldview anti modernism, reverse patriotism. These are things we have to combat. Well, I. I'm certainly on board with that, but I, but I want to fight. I think that's one reason why Stephanie has uh, sent me to you for further instruction. She, she's been working on me for years now. I want conflict. I, I want to win. Uh, I, I want my defense of modernity against the barbarians who are at the gates. In my case, they're at the gates of the university. They're canceling speakers. They won't allow for the full discussion of ideas because they think they already know what's right and they are aggressive in enforcing conformity with their presuppositions about what's right. And that offends me, I must be honest with you, and, and frightens me and threatens me and, and, I, and I wanna fight. And our friend Stephanie, who has introduced me to you, uh, is trying to counsel me otherwise. And, and I'm not yet persuaded that these barbarians don't need to be, quote, defeated uh, rather than, and I don't even know what the alternative to defeating them is because they sure don't seem interested in negotiation or uh, reasoned deliberation. They seem interested in having, having their way. They want to call me a transphobe. If I ask a certain question, they want to call me, not me personally, but people like me who have my ideas racist. If we raise certain uh, certain issues, if if I am concerned about the future of the family as an institution, because all of these evolutions of liberation seem to be tearing at the fabric of social structure, and I'm conservative with a small c, conservative about that, they they're going to call me, uh, you know, they're going to call me a name, they're going to call me a patri a defender of the patriarchy, and. I, I'm not sure what you guys have in mind for managing the evolution of culture through these various phases and challenges. But for my money, the barbarians need to be, first of all, identified, and secondly, opposed vociferously. Tell me why I'm wrong about that. You're not wrong. I thoroughly agree with you. I think that uh, defeating uh, these forces, right, the, and, and, and their uncharitable narrative of the American project, as you put it, is uh, imperative right now. That's why I'm so inspired by your thought leadership and, and others who are sort of really leading the way in, in a powerful way, like uh, Barry, uh, Barry Weiss. Uh, her latest speech to the uh, Austin University was you know, deeply inspiring to my heart. I agree with her thoroughly. And um, so in some ways, the fact that the, the, the battle has been joined is a good, a good sign, because I think that ultimately the forces of, of truth and goodness and beauty will prevail. Um, and I, I think this is certainly, you know, a, a threat and a regression. So I agree that that fighting needs to take place to a degree. I mean, we should tell people if there is anyone who doesn't know Barry Weiss, formerly of the New York Times with a very successful and influential substack now, uh, is uh, also an advisor to the University of Austin, a new uh, higher education institution that's being uh, stood up De novo stood up from scratch in Austin, Texas. Uh, Pano Canelos is the president, uh, the leader of this enterprise. But yeah, Barry Barry has become a friend, and you know she's she's fairly combative uh, on occasion when when the stakes get high enough when she's talking about the stuff that's near and dear to her heart. Um, what has the work of the uh, Institute for Cultural Evolution? if I may ask, accomplished in the years that you've been, that you guys have been laboring away? Well, the, the, uh, the, the development of this political philosophy itself, which offers a new, a new front in the culture war, if you will, or a, a new approach to understanding uh, our opponents, if, if I can at least put it that way, right? Those who would tear down the best of what's come before, you know, that, that those who were hostile, the American project, um, those who I think wrongly attribute things like uh, you know systemic white racism and white supremacy to American culture. Um, I, I think we can get nuanced about 
you know what that how how we might find some truth in that, but but certainly I would agree that it's overblown. Um, so part of it involves understanding. Again, I don't want to put it in such stark terms, but I will for purposes of this conversation. Understanding our enemy, understanding what they're after, trying to be as sympathetic as possible, while also recognizing our duty to um, uh, to fight against those who would you know destroy. Uh, the American project. So, so what have we accomplished? I mean, we've we've had a, a variety of influential uh, um, uh, sort of conclaves, elite gatherings, where we talked about what the future of the right and the future of the left would be. This idea of, of the the current left and the current right are um, uh, unsuitably developed for the challenges of our present age. So, we've we've done a lot of that. We learned a lot. We met a lot of important people. Um, then uh, we, we decided we needed to put a, a stake in the ground regarding a book. So I began in 2017 to work on this book, Developmental Politics. It was finally published in 2020. Um, at the same time, I also co-authored a book with John Mackey um, from Whole Foods, Conscious Leadership, which is sort of a, a, a celebration of, of the, the goodness of business and the free enterprise system and how it can be improved and, and, and continue to made, uh, be made better and more pro-social. Um, and then beginning in, in 2020, after the book was launched, we've been organization building. So we've had a lot of new directors join us. We've had a, our budget has expanded significantly. We've been hiring people. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to put this way of seeing this developmental perspective. We're trying to put this on the map of the culture because we think it can be very uh, useful in um, dealing with the problems that afflict America at the moment. Okay, so help me understand the, the developmental perspective a little bit more. There are there are seeds of value e even in the most uh, reactionary or uh, seemingly uh, nihilistic uh, rejections of modernity. That's really a, I meant to be a question. Uh, sure. d is is that part of the proposition that these are predictable? Um, uh, counter movements uh, that can be threatening, but that uh, can also be a source of some learning uh, and how we can improve, uh, you know, our the way we we uh, govern ourselves and it relate to each other, something like that. Sure, I, an important way of understanding these these cultural dimensions that we're talking about is by understanding the political significance of what we might call transcendence, right? Some, some higher purpose or sacred cause. I've uh, never, you know, since Proverbs in the Bible, right? Where there is no vision, the people perish. So this sort of search for something greater than yourself, for which you can sacrifice your self-interest, you know, for the group good, that's been a, a strong motivating factor in human evolution for thousands of years. And it's taken various forms. So we might think of it as an upward current, right? Or, or a, a kind of a magnetism, a gravity of transcendence, right? This sort of vision of uh, what, what the good life is or how the world can be made better or, or what's wrong and that needs to be fixed. There's all kinds of ways that this, this higher cause can be conceived. But for thousands of years in these great religious civilizations, as I've discussed, it's what now composes probably 30% of the American population have a kind of center of gravity with it that remains within the traditional worldview, like 30% of Americans are evangelical Christians, you know, which we can personally respect and, and want to be allied with for their good parts. So they're, they're responding to this current of transcendence that's defined by their religion. And, and with modernity, we see a, another kind of, uh, another awakening to another current of transcendence, which can be understood as uh, um, liberation of the individual, Right, the protection of the sovereignty of our uh, as as citizens, political actors. Um, so, liberal values as a whole is is part of the new view of transcendence. But also progress, right? Uh, scientific progress, technological progress, economic progress. These are all of the the visions of transcendence which um, animate right the the deep cultural yearnings, which helps bring about this worldview of modernity. And so then. In history, you know, we see these patterns, the dialectic of traditionalism, this dialectical current of modernity. Now, predictably, we see a, a, a countercurrent, a counterculture to modernity that's gradually emerged and has gained significant cultural power, especially in the last uh, few years, 
Um, I mean, I would say the election of Donald Trump is both a symptom of the pre-existing tensions that come from that, as well as an accelerant, right? Trump's presidency helped uh, drive um, the cultural ascendancy of progressive postmodernism. And <clears throat> when we think about the currents of transcendence that, that progressive postmodernism is trying to achieve, I mean, part of the reason that it emerged is that they see modernity as lacking adequate transcendence. In other words, just achieving status and material. Once you've already achieved that or your parents have achieved it, you look around and say, is this all there is? So there's, there's this sort of animating notion within progressive culture that there are new kinds of transcendence to be sought. They don't want to find those forms of transcendence in the previous traditional religion. And they're trying to push away from modernity, not only because it lacks uh, the transcendence that they're hungry for, but also because it's, it's created these negative externalities, which they see as threatening that which they hold dear, like the planet. So the, the, the current of transcendence that, that progressive postmodernism has been pursuing, it's pursued it in, um, uh, at least historically, over the past few decades, liberation of women, right? The creating environmental sustainability, um, LGBTQ uh, liberation, um, and of course, civil rights have been there the entire time. And it was sort of racial equality is one of the senses of transcendence that this worldview pursues. However, politically speaking, even though it's culturally powerful, it hasn't gained as much power in the political realm as it has in the cultural realm. And partially, part of this is because it hasn't been able to uh, kind of create strong political will, right? So the concern for the environment creates some political will, but it continues to be down on the list of issues that Democratic voters are concerned about. So in the past few years, what it's found is, is a kind of transcendence that's, that's energized its, its political base. It's given it this sense of, of um, renewed political militancy. And I think that the big mistake is that it's found this form of transcendence by regressing to an ethnocentric. I mean, in other words, this progressive worldview strives for a world-centric ethic where everybody counts, and especially those who've been marginalized or, or uh, victimized, that those people are seen as the sort of the most morally deserving within our circle of care. And I would say that that's a beautiful thing. Um, but I also say that, that by racializing that world-centric morality, and gaining traction through um, the, the, the ascendancy of anti-racist anti -racist ideology, that the, the, their folks who were making their home and getting kind of sustenance, cultural sustenance from this progressive worldview, who were essentially pre-modern in their, in their moral development, right? This sort of ethnocentric uh, morality is a characteristic of the traditional worldview. With modernity, we get a more nation-centric and a beginning of a more world-centric sense of morality. And then progressivism embraces world centrism more fully. But by, by going backwards in history, it's found this strong political will, but it's done so uh, at the price of its own cultural regression, I would say. And so this is good. This shows the, the relative cultural exhaustion of progressive postmodernism signaling the way for, uh, for uh, the next step of our evolution. I mean, if you'll allow me to make one more statement about this from an abstract perspective, the well-known course of dialectical development, right? We could certainly argue about whether that's valid or not, but it seems fairly evident in the historical record at this point that we have, you know, modernity, the great fact. And then we have progressivism, which is sort of stakes out the position of antithesis, right? Anti-modernism, reverse patriotism. It defines itself in opposition. To the thesis of modernity. And that antithesis signals the opportunity as it matures and begins to become more of a stale thesis of itself. It points the way toward a synthesis. And that's what we represent as a think tank, is this cultural synthesis that can carry forward the best and prune away the worst of all of these previous cultural structures, not just in a mashup, but in a way that preserves the, the challenge that, that each has to the other. You know, that the, the values of each one of these worldviews are partially shaped and charged by their interaction with the worldview that came before and, and is now coming after. Whether this is progression or not, we can argue, but it's certainly sequential in history, right? Traditionalism being the oldest, progressivism as a cultural structure being the most recent. 
we think that on the horizon of history now, there is emerging the opportunity for a, a new kind of culture that revalorizes modernity, that reclaims uh, the, the, the foundation of classical liberal values, and which um, reestablishes what you might call uh, the polarity of, of grievance and gratitude, right? So polarity theory is a big part of our philosophy, which means that certain values come in sets, like liberty and equality, right? Or real and ideal, that, that ideally they, they challenge and support each other. They moderate each other to create their own value. And when it comes to grievance and gratitude, we see with progressivism, all grievance and no gratitude. And ultimately that becomes pathological. So we're trying to reestablish a sense of gratitude for America, a gratitude for our heritage, a gratitude for our history, a gratitude for our prosperity, um, even as we acknowledge some of the uh, valid points of the grievance which progressivism has brought. Wow. Okay, so we got Hegel, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. I mean, we're not Can Hegelians we strictly, but we... You know, we but, well, uh, you know, my you know, like, my college philosophy courses were a long time ago, but I I vaguely remember associating the thesis, antithesis, synthesis accounts of history with with the writings of Hegel uh, and Marx and sure. cap in capitalism. And uh, I'm wondering where the this big argument I just uh, interviewed here a couple of weeks ago with John McWhorter, uh, Richard Wolff, who's a Marxist economist, formerly at the oh, University of Massachusetts. He's very well known on, you had lunch with him. Is no, that no, what you, you said? were patient with him. Oh, I, I was told oh, you saw that, you saw, yeah. Yeah, I don't play well with Marxists, so no, I didn't have lunch <laughs> I was gonna ask you about that. I, I gave him enough rope to hang himself, as it were. He was gonna talk no matter what I did, so I decided I was gonna let him talk and try to ask a pointed question here and there. And in, and in his uh, responses to my questions, he would reveal uh, both the insights, but also the inadequacies of his worldview. This, is, this was my theory of the case there. But, uh, you know, people are saying capitalism is the problem. Where do, you, where do you stand on that? Well, I think economic freedom, as, as I like to call it, I mean, we certainly can call it capitalism. I'm, I'm not allergic to that word. But I think that the, the, this emergence of, of liberal values, which are, are, are kind of a suite of values, right? Free speech, free association, freedom of religion. Economic freedom is one of the cornerstones of those liberal values, right? Without economic freedom, the rest of those freedoms don't mean a lot. Uh, and so I would say economic freedom is uh, um, part of this backbone upon which all future cultural evolution you know, ultimately will rest. And so I'm a, a, a proponent of capitalism, although I think that we need to improve it. I mean, like any human endeavor, right? It has negatives to it. And, and overcoming those negatives is certainly part of the way we can um, make sure that economic freedom is retained going forward in our history. You're working here in the United States. Do you see a difference in how these issues of modernity and post-modernity and transitions and so on are handled in, let's say, Northern Europe, uh, as opposed to uh, what we're doing here in the United States. Uh, what do you make of the rise here in the 21st century of um, East Asia and uh, South Asia as players in the global uh, political, economic, intellectual scene? Um, that kind of thing. Sure. Well, I'd say that as far as East Asia goes, that's a good illustration of, of how this worldview of modernity, you know, modernist consciousness, we might even call it, is a, uh, um, it's, it's the foundation of economic prosperity. Uh, it, it's what allows countries like Japan and South Korea and, you know, the Asian tigers to become economic powerhouses, partially because they have, Japan especially, has a strong foundation of traditionalism, right? They were isolated for almost 300 years and their traditional Japanese culture became well-developed. And even though they had this transition period where they adopted, you know, pseudo-modernity, we might call it, the sort of the militant, uh, you know, uh, the Japanese empire, um, after World War II, uh, the United States effectively, effectively shepherded that country into, you know, a liberal democracy or at least something close to it. And that's been, part and parcel of their prosperity and their liberty as a country. 
You could say the same thing about South Korea. So modernity isn't just a European or American uh, kind of culture. It can be adopted and pursued, and, and it can produce the, uh, the improvements of the human condition that it brings wherever it can be effectively adopted. But where the previously underlying traditional worldview has been significantly damaged, right, where it, it's unhealthy, like I would say in some places in Latin America or in, in some Islamic societies, the, the traditional worldview itself has not become successful enough to provide a platform for its own transcendence or a, a platform for a support of, of a, a modernist culture and the prosperity and liberty that go with that. So, you know, that's, that's part of the analysis of understanding these worldviews. That's part of why modernity first emerged uh, in Western Europe and the United States, because Protestant Christianity had become one of the most successful kinds of traditional culture, and, and it, it, because it was so successful, it led to and ultimately supported the emergence of you know, modernity during the Enlightenment. So in Europe, we could see differences. In the United States, their culture war is there, but it's not quite as strong. And I think partially because their versions, that their, their traditionalism is not as strong. I mean, the, the, whereas traditionalism remains a traditional religious cultural configuration, remains a significantly um, uh, large part of American culture. Uh, traditionalism in Europe, especially in Western Europe, has, has faded out more. So there's not that strong uh, pull of traditionalism. And their version of progressivism has, has not been as uh, militant. It hasn't been as anti-modernist or anti-patriotic. So, so the culture war is hotter in the United States, but um, I think that's, you know, there's lots of different reasons we could talk about for that, but we can still see it expressed, for example, in France or in England or, you know, in Scandinavia. Uh, we still see these culture war issues, but they have a different flavor and I would say somewhat less intensity I guess Britain is the closest to America in terms of its uh, uh, culture war characteristics. You know, we're sitting here just a few days after Salman Rushdie was attacked uh, on stage at the Chautauqua Institution in Western New York. Um, everybody knows Salman Rushdie, the writer, uh, uh, a, a sentence of death pronounced upon him by an Iranian ayatollah because of the perceived blasphemy of his book. Um, the book was published, I believe, in 1988. That was 34 years ago, and yet they, you know, he, he still exists under the cloud of this threat. And now, him thinking perhaps that he was relatively safe and being willing to appear in public uh, relatively unguarded, he gets attacked on stage. And I, I thought, I'm, I'm trying to get your reaction to this thought, I thought, okay, radical Islamic fundamentalism, this is as anti-modern as you could possibly be. Uh, still, the specter hangs over, even in a, a, a as placid uh, uh, an environment as the uh, Chautauqua Institution's grounds. I don't know if you've ever been there in uh, near Lake, Lake Erie, just south of Buffalo. In Western New York, I mean, it's it's like I don't know a couple hundred acres of wooded uh, land with lakes, and people have vacation houses, and they go there. There's this big amphitheater that seats four thousand people. I've actually spoken in this in this place. That's where Rushdie was giving his lecture, um, and a bunch of retired uh, New York City school teachers uh, who you know are interested in ideas, and and also like a take their canoes out or take a hike in the woods or whatever. And, and, you know, they're out there, they have, they, they own properties or they rent. It's, you know, placid and, and kind of sweet. Uh, and the idea of someone being stabbed on stage. Anyway, I go on too long. It's, it's horrific. I agree. The threat of Islamic terrorism is what I'm, the threat of, of a kind of unreasoned, uh, fanatical fundamentalist religious commitment which turns violent. Um, how do you meet that with anything other than force? Well, I'd say force is necessary. I mean, I mean, in other words, force is necessary, but not sufficient. So, so how can we foster evolution, cultural evolution in Islamic societies? Yeah, but I, mean, I, I don't claim to be an expert on such. I mean, I want to have some epistemic humility about saying anything regarding it. 
But I think that there are many people, many intellectuals and, and reformers and leaders in the Islamic world who recognize that what happened in Christianity and Judaism, right, and Hinduism to a degree, there was a, a reformation of the religion that allowed for modernity to emerge in a healthy way, a truce between the traditional worldview and the modernist worldview. That's that, you know, at least you know, both challenge and support, right? There's a dialectic between these worldviews. So the, the, the conflict between modernity and traditionalism can still be found in, in most of the developed world in various forms. But the conflict is most virulent um, in the, the Islamic world where anti-modernism from below, from the traditional realm, has been um, particularly strong as a cultural force I, my analysis of that, I wrote a, um, a white paper about this um, right after the Charlie Hebdo uh, massacre, uh, where I talked about the, what is it about Islamic society that makes them uh, resist uh, modernity, even though there could be a, an authentically Islamic, homegrown version of modernity. I mean, we see some of it, right, in Indonesia. Some of it was in Turkey before you know, the, um, the, their current prime minister uh, kind of took them backwards. But the challenges of this Islamic civilization to accommodate modernity and grow its own version of it, I think are complicated by the fact, like I said earlier, that if, if, we, if we analyze these historical currents and we see that, that the places where modernity is most successful is where the traditional underlying culture is most successful, I'd say that the, the best way to foster a homegrown version of Islamic modernity and liberalism would be to make, ironically perhaps, or contradictory perhaps, make Islamic, the, the, the good parts of the Islamic religion, um, to emphasize the truth, beauty, and goodness that's in Islam as a religion, to make it more successful, to encourage its own reformation. We can't force a reformation on them. They have to do it voluntarily. Again, there are many leading intellectuals in various Islamic countries who have written extensively about the Islamic Reformation and the, um, the barriers to it. Um, but I think if the West were, were to, to understand, I mean, I think we do to a degree, but I think we had a deeper cultural analysis of how we can foster uh, an Islamic Reformation, I think we could approach it in, a, in addition to fighting it. We could, we could help it in, 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 a, in a, with a deft hand, so to speak, to encourage its own cultural evolution, eventually leading to a, a, a truce with the globalizing you know, world of modernity. I was friends with the late sociologist Peter Berger when I taught at Boston University uh, years ago. And he was constantly making this point about the internal dynamic within Islam of reform and contestation and a kind of churning thing that goes, it's not one thing, it's not a fixed thing. It's a moving thing. And he would cite uh, the uh, relatively modern uh, critical writings that, that were coming out of some scholars, Islamic scholars in Indonesia as evidence of this, of this uh, trend. Uh, you know, okay, I mean, from your lips to God's ears, I would want to say, I mean, I'd like to see it happen, but I, I can't say I'm optimistic. Well, and, and, and a complicating factor is this progressive postmodern worldview, which I have, we've, we've talked about here at the beginning of the conversation, that this has inflamed uh, Islamic fundamentalism, right? It's given them ammunition, right? If you go on Al Jazeera, many of the Islamic fundamentalists are spouting, you know, uh, uh, progressive postmodern memes about, uh, about you know, the evils of modernity, right? So th they see the enemy of their enemy is their friend, and so there's this kind of tentative alliance between many militant progressive activists and many traditional uh, Islamic militants. And, and, you know, that makes things worse, I would say. Okay, so progressive postmodernism, what's, what are some of the nuggets of good stuff? Great. I'm glad you asked. Certainly, uh, <laughs> um, certainly this kind of a, a full embrace of world-centric morality, right? So it's not just Americans that, that we need to be morally concerned about, it's everybody in the world, especially people who've been disadvantaged or, so this, it, a, a way of talking about the set of values, the good parts is they're caring values. They go beyond just fairness. They embrace sort of righting the wrongs of history and, and uplifting those who've been left behind. And so in that way, uh, we can see that there is this sort of charitable, you know, beautiful, uh, uh, kind of drive to uplift 
uh, you know, the victims of the world. That's a, that's a good part. Another part is recognizing um, that that our concern for the environment isn't just a lifestyle issue. It's actually a, a sacred duty that we have to the biosphere uh, to preserve uh, its health and vitality, and to make sure that um, the the growth of our economy does not um, damage the environment in irreparable ways that'll ultimately damage the economy and, and everything else about civilization. So this kind of you know the 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 heartfelt sense of, of, of environmental stewardship and the value of sustainability, I'd say those are necessary, right? That we're, if we want to make a better world, we're going to need to be environmentally conscious. We're ne- going to need to be aware of, of, you know, those who've been left behind. Um, another thing would be, of course, uh, gender equality, right? That begins in modernity with, uh, uh, you know, um, early feminist activists and the suffragette movement. But it, it continues on and in some ways becomes, you know, questionable, I would say, within progressivism. But, but in the same way in the 60s that, that, that the um, segregation and Jim Crow had not been thoroughly overcome, and, and part of the civil rights movement was to end that, and I think effectively did, although there's still, you know, um, equality issues going forward. Feminism was the same, right? It, it, women had had the vote. They, they, were, they were equal in some ways, but they weren't culturally equal. Right there was still the patriarchy, as it's called, and so taking the, you know the second wave of feminism, at least as as you know we saw in the seventies, um, did uh, make the world a better place in the sense that w- one of the objective markers for how evolved a culture is is how equal the sexes are. Right, the the the, the less equal the sexes, the less evolved the culture, just in stark terms. So so equality of the sexes, a very important. Uh, value and a, a partial achievement um, within progressive culture. I would say similarly, um, the the social norming around the acceptance of uh, um, gay people, right? That did not exist uh, until recently. And I would say that that has been one of the sterling achievements of this progressive postmodern worldview is the championing of, of gay rights. Um, so there, there's, a, there's a, a variety of ways in which progressivism has, has helped us become more caring, more world-centric, more sensitive, uh, m- more t- attuned to equality. And these are all positives, um, but of course, they're accompanied by, close, closely woven together with significant pathologies that now threaten the larger society, um, which is good news and bad news. The good news is that they're a threat and we have to fight, as you said. Um, but the, uh, the good news is that, that these very pathologies are creating the necessary problematic life conditions that can awaken this next step of evolution, right? The synthesis. Part of the way Hegel described the synthesis was as the negation of the negation. And what that means is that we're rejecting the rejection, right? The, 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 the intensely grievance-motivated culture of progressivism um, is, is we have an opportunity to go beyond it by, by reclaiming our gratitude, as, as Barry Weiss says you know, in, her, in her speech, you know, are, are recognizing how privileged we are as Americans and how that privilege, um, uh, uh, go, what goes with that is a duty to preserve and be grateful of, of all of the incredible achievements that we've made as a nation and a society. Gratitude, an emphasis on gratitude. Uh, what about grace? Well, grace is certainly um, a, a big part of my philosophy. Um, you know, I, I talk about fostering cultural evolution. Part of it is we can create conditions, but we can't socially engineer it because part of these, these, these forms, these major periods in history where there was some kind of new emergence, uh, there's, a, there's an element of grace involved in it, right? And so a certain amount of uh, faith and hope um, are, are necessary virtues for not only recognizing the role of grace in our lives and in our, our history. Um, so, so grace is one of my favorite concepts. Okay. Donald J. Trump, he's probably going to run for president again in 2024. Um, again, as we speak, we're still talking about the FBI raiding his residence at Mar-a-Lago in Florida, Palm Beach, and, uh, the right wing press, uh, on my reading are absolutely hysterical about the FBI, the Biden administration, Justice Department, 
poking around an ex-president's residence looking for boxes of purloined uh, papers. Um, I feel like sometimes, and people talk about seceding from the country, you know, California, et cetera. Um, the, the heated uh, antagonisms between the camps, the red and the blue, uh, I don't know if we're not on a path to, if not civil war, then protracted conflict. I mean, there will be a Republican administration, there'll be a Democratic administration, there'll be recrimination, there'll be payback. Uh, there will be investigations. There will be hearings. Um, are you optimistic about the the future of political culture in the United States? Uh, are we are we growing further and further apart? The big sort. People are moving around. They're affiliating. The technology of uh, social media and the internet, which allows us to create worlds for ourselves that consist only of people who think like ourselves, and so on. Um, I'm, I'm asking uh, what you see as uh, the the future for American political culture going forward from your perspective. Sure. Well, I think you know certainly you know regression is always a possibility. You know the uh, the the United States collapsing into some kind of second civil war. I don't see that as the likely most likely scenario. But I I won't discount the fact that there is a, a possibility. We could argue about what that possibility is. Um, ultimately. Um, I, I would say, you know, optimism is like a bet about the future, and hope is, I, I'd say, a, a more central virtue to this question. Um, being, a, a, you know, a first-generation American, I, I have a deep love of America just as, as my own identity, and I'd say that the, the forces that have brought about America in world history, I mean, in some ways, the emergence of the American nation is one of the greatest events in human history. I'd say that those forces can't be so easy, easily vanquished and that I, I do have a, a confidence, let's call it, that we will grow our way out of this, but certainly not without pain and recrimination and the kind of, uh, of, of you know, craziness that we're seeing now. I mean, it's, it's we're sort of passing through this, this um, crucible of uh, political conflict, and, but I, I think that the possibility that this conflict can bring about our growth as a society. I mean, that's what we're working for. So obviously we're optimistic about its potential. Do you and Mackie talk about that in uh, your book, uh, Political Development? Sure. Uh, c c conscious Leadership uh, is, the, this is the name of the book. I beg we, your pardon. We, yeah, yeah. Conscious Leadership. So at the end, um, I, I wrote an appendix, which kind of stands alone. It's called uh, Cultivating Cultural Intelligence. So this idea of cultural intelligence, as we're defining it, is the ability to kind of see what worldview defines your identity. And within the culture war, recognize that the worldviews you oppose have certainly pathologies which cause you to oppose them, but also positive values which, uh, which you can uh, value yourself. That is, that you can become more culturally intelligent by expanding the scope of what you're able to value and that means valuing some of the, the, the values of these worldviews that you oppose. So it's a practice. It's a little bit like emotional intelligence. Like in the 90s, emotional intelligence was uh, promoted as a leadership skill. And while the, the, the cultural space we're working to create is more than just a leadership skill, this is at least one way that we can attempt to mainstream it and make it useful is by talking about cultural intelligence and how it works. So in the appendix, we talk about these worldviews. We talk about the positives and the negatives of each, how they're ultimately, despite their conflicts, how they're interdependent, how they need each other, how, as I said, you know, the traditional, um, successful traditionalism is a foundation for successful modernity. And despite its rejection, the, the conditions of modernity are absolutely necessary for progressive postmodernism. Without the prosperity and the liberty and all the gifts of modernity, the progressive culture would never be able to, to get off the ground. So understanding the gifts of each one of these and how they can, in fact, be integrated into a larger whole without discounting the negatives of each, this is this practice of cultural intelligence and is very useful uh, for business people, especially, who are working with stakeholders who represent all these different worldviews in the same place. Yeah, I think that's the message that our friend Stephanie wanted me to, to, to take, which is that there's something to be learned from listening and trying to understand the worldview of people who have a 
have a different position than I do. And that's not the same thing as seeding uh, ground. That, that, that's actually growth for me. Not, not, uh, you know, it's, not a zero sum, it's not a zero sum game. Right. Like I said, it's a judo move. You know, we're trying to, we're, we're trying to do what progressive postmodernism can't. Right? So they say that they, they want to be more inclusive, but their sense of inclusivity only extends to those who share their worldview. Right? Right. So we want to be even more inclusive than progressive postmodernism and not only include those who've been marginalized or victimized, we want to include you know, modernists and traditionalists and, and uh, people who, who make meaning from the entire spectrum of cultural evolution and do so in a way that honors each one of these uh, worldviews and recognizes them as stakeholders in our democracy. Okay, Steve, here, as we conclude, I want to stick my neck out a little bit. You, as you know, we talk about race and inequality and racial conflict and Black Lives Matter and diversity and inclusion and all of that a lot here at The Glenn Show. I'm black. Uh, with my friend John McWhorter, every other week here at The Glenn Show, we're talking about race issues. Um, I'm going to ask you, what do you, th you think we're getting right? What do you think we're getting wrong as we engage in this most heated, you know, juncture of, of political agitation and conflict in America? Summer of 2020, George Floyd gets killed. There are demonstrations, some of them peaceful, some of them not. A lot of agitation, defund the police, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And reaction to it on the right, Trump, you know, doing his thing. Uh, the country getting, you know, Kenosha, Wisconsin. I mean, we could give a lot of examples. What do we get? I'm asking you, what do you think we're getting right here at the Glenn Show about that? And where do you think we could perhaps grow uh, under the influence of the <laughs> thought <laughs> leadership of the Institute for Cultural Evolution? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Well, let me say first, I, that I think you're getting a lot right. I, th I think that that Thank you. As you have emphasized, um, the, the, the difference between the bias narrative and the development narrative, obviously that, you know, the development narrative is music to our ears when you talk about it. Um, and, and I have studied this perspective, for example, uh, you know, this book, uh, an Anthology by Orlando Patterson, uh, The Cultural Matrix. I've read that as carefully as possible to sort of understand from a perspective of a, a you know, center left modernist what the upheavals and, and what is this systemic racism that um, these progressives keep pointing to? Where does it exist, right? So Orlando Patterson's not woke, but he's certainly not uh, on the right either. No, so he's I, not. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I've tried to, um, to, to uh, integrate uh, the thinking of that sociological camp with our larger understanding of cultural evolution. I think that, um, that, Seeing um, that uh, the, this anti-racism ideology, right, the virulent, you know, Kendi-style anti-racism ideology, as uh, you know, a, a virulent ideology, a threatening ide ideology, an ideology that is propagating falsehoods that threaten the foundations of our society. I think that calling that out and and making it clear that the best way to overcome the um, the inequality. You know that's a blight on our nation, or you know maybe inequality is not the right word, but but you know the situation, the the, the problems which animate uh, much of the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, um, that that overcoming that pathology involves sort of recognizing how it has achieved its cultural traction by embracing this kind of ethnocentric version of us and them, this kind of you know racialization in a sense is very ethnocentric. I mean, maybe it's, you know, biologically based or externally based on external characteristics, but nevertheless, it's very much an us versus them identity politics. It's been called tribalism, right? These are all regressions in our culture, which need to be fought against. But part of the way that we can, we can understand, we can be sympathetic to a kind of what they're getting at is that the, the, the civil rights movement created a lot of progress. And yet the stubborn, what they perceive as, as inequality, right, the, the statistics of success, which show that, you know, as an aggregate population, black people don't have the same kind of wealth as, as yeah. other racial groups, right? These are some of the objective markers that they're pointing to, which they claim uh, are being caused by systemic racism. Um, and uh, I, 
disagree with that narrative, but part of the way we can be sympathetic to it and understand it from a cultural dimension, as Orlando Patterson attempts to do, is to recognize that there, there, we talked about these worldviews, right? Traditional, modern, and progressive. There's a worldview, a stubbornly persistent remnant of a cultural worldview that, that exists in the timeline of history before traditionalism. We might call it pre-traditional, right? Orlando uh, Patterson calls it the street configuration, right? And it's certainly, you know, they've been very careful to say in inner city neighborhoods, in distressed neighborhoods, the majority of the people who live there don't, are, are not embedded in this street configuration, this pre-traditional worldview. But the, the fact that, that it persists there, as seen in gang culture and prison culture and, and you know, sort of the, the gangster mentality that is behind much of the, the shootings and, and you know, the, the turmoil that exists in these, in these places, that that does radiate out. It, it, it is partially responsible for the, persistent, the persistence of the inequality and, and the, um, uh, the, the large percentages of, of black people who were in prison. This worldview, we might call it pre-traditional, I think there's a dignity there. I mean, I think certainly it's, it's, it's antisocial. We can't just sort of, it, it, it's not compatible with a law-abiding civilization. So we have to be able to be biased against this form of culture, but it's not specific just to black people. This pre-traditional warrior culture, I think if we want to talk about it with a certain amount of dignity, we can say, we call it warrior consciousness and culture. It's, it's developmental psychology uh, recognizes it as egocentric consciousness or pre-conventional consciousness. And you can see it in white people in the skinheads, right? You can see it in Latin, you know, Hispanic people in MS-13, right? You can see that even Asian people have, you know, the Hmong street gangs, right? So this, this form of culture, this warrior culture uh, is, is stubborn. It, it, it persists across generations and um, overcoming it, helping the, those who are trapped within it to evolve out of it, I would say is a, a key element of achieving the, the otherwise laudable goals of, of the anti-racism movement, and that is greater equality. But as you've said, and I want to just underline how much I agree, that ultimately you know, the, the, the racializing this problem sets it back. You know, in other words, it, it may create more racism uh, in the long run, or at least it, there's, there's some danger there. So I think calling it systemic racism and, and, and blaming it on the persistent racism in our society, while there's certainly some, I would say the systemic element is better understood from a cultural lens that recognizes how this worldview has a kind of a membrane. People are trapped in it and how we can gently persuade people to evolve out of it. Again, that's, you know, one of the contributors to the Cultural Matrix book, Tommy Shelby. He, in, his, in his contribution, he tries to um, steel man the argument for uh, development, you know, that as black families have been, have been devastated and, and that we, we need to create a sort of culture of responsibility, all of which I agree with. He basically says that what he calls soul building, that the government can't do that, that, the, that, that our, our, you know, the Constitution would prevent, and, and that's paternalistic, and he's got, he, you know, after steel manning the argument, he then, you know, rejects it. But I, 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 I reject his rejection, and I think that we do have an obligation uh, uh, to, to do some soul-making. And I think that part of it involves changing the physical life conditions. Like you said, like if you take $10 billion and put $100 million into each one of these distressed inner cities, that would go a long way. But just external reform isn't adequate. It's necessary but not sufficient. We also need internal reform. And how do we go about that? I mean, maybe the government can't do it, but... Certainly NGOs. I mean, there's like you mentioned the the, the nurses that go to um, the you know unwed mothers and, and and serve as role models, right? They talk about that in the cultural matrix. So that's that's an example of um, an institutional attempt at soul making, soul building. Um, and I, I think we can also see other examples of, of the success of what you might call the evolution of consciousness interventions. You know, fostering cultural evolution. In um, a European example, uh, in the late 19th century, there was um, a movement within, um, especially Scandinavia, for what they called transformative civic education. There were these retreats that they sent young people to. It's called Bildung. And, and this idea of Bildung was to, was to sort of um, help people awaken to modernist consciousness, right? To, to sort of 
recognize, sort of take responsibility and have a go at creating something new and, and being part of progress. So that's just one small example. I think we probably agree on numerous examples of successful soul building. And I think that's what needs to happen um, in many of these inner cities. And that would go a long way to reducing inequality, crime, the prison population. Um, we can almost say that almost every human problem is at least partially a problem of consciousness because the solution to that problem involves raising consciousness, evolving consciousness, and consciousness evolves in you know, lots of ways, but one of the most significant ways it evolves is through identification with these structures of history, these cultural agreement structures. And so what it means to evolve your consciousness, at least partially, is to evolve from pre-traditional to traditional, to, from traditional to modern. And because progressivism is, is sort of dissolves traditional culture, it, tr it competes with traditional culture in a way that invalidates many of the needed elements of traditional culture. Traditional culture has the moral resources to deal with wo the warrior worldview. Progressivism is defenseless against it. It gets gamed and grifted by, by those who are at this you know, warrior egocentric level. And so understanding that we need the resources of traditionalism, we need strong families, and that progressivism's you know, attack on the very family structure is, is a pathology of progressivism that we need to remedy to strengthen traditionalism so we can play its necessary role in this larger cultural ecosystem of, of helping people move beyond the stuckness of this warrior culture, which um, plagues our society still. Okay, Steve. We've got uh, politics, we've got psychology, we've got spirituality, we've got transcendence. We've got gratitude and we've got hope. Um, I like the sound of it. So thanks for, thanks for sharing. And I'm, this is the first of uh, many conversations I expect to be having with the community centered around uh, the Institute for Cultural Evolution. Um, making no commitments, but expressing my interest in uh, learning more and, and, and going deeper. So right. let's stay in touch. You as, as a strong ally and an inspirational uh, you know, leader in your own right for this movement. I mean, from a cultural standpoint, we want to make common cause with you and Barry Weiss and some of the other people who are attracted to um, in the Austin University, for example. You know, a lot of it is, is animated by, you know, this sort of reaction to progressivism and the pathologies of progressivism, and we think that's appropriate and healthy. But we want to help this movement by helping them uh, uh, transcend and include the best of progressivism and effectively move from this, you know, cultural antithesis to a cultural synthesis. And your leadership's an important part of that. Thanks. Thanks very much, Steve McIntosh, President, Institute for uh, Cultural Evolution, Boulder, Colorado, my guest here at the Glenn Show. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Glenn.